So, Shush Moretti is the Breckenridge Chair of Ornithology and the Bell Museum's Curator of Birds for the University of Minnesota. Uh, her research is focusing on biological diversity and evolutionary history of birds, addressing two of the most challenging questions of avian systematics, phylogenetics and biogeography of birds in the old world tropics and the deep relationship of the avian tree of life. Shushma. So great to see you all this morning, and we're just uh, making sure everything works. Can everyone hear me? No, okay. Um, is this better? <laughs> um, okay. Great, um, and I don't think I have a pointer, so I'll just try to walk over if there's something I really want you to notice. So uh, today I'm gonna talk to you about a project I've been working on for many years now. And um, as I start, I wanna make sure I acknowledge, thank you, um, that all of this work is highly dependent on museum collections. So this is me wearing my museum curator badge here, and um, I really wanna make sure that it's um, clear that all of this research, even though it might not explicitly be clear, is based on the fact that we have specimens in museums that we can refer to over and over again, right? And these are specimens that have been collected over decades by dozens and dozens of researchers and explorers. So the exploration of different parts of the world has really led to our understanding of biodiversity and being able to bring back these specimens to different museums and being able to compare them from specimens from different areas and different places and different time periods really helps us to really build the story of how biodiversity um, exists and changed over time. Um, my research on the birds of Madagascar was highly dependent on these sources and so I really stand on the shoulders of giants, right? Explorers that came before me and were able to bring back specimens to various museums and publish their monographs and their observations that I was able to refer to. New explorations where we went out and collected more specimens and um, access to all of these museums. So um, as in museum collections, we think of ourselves as a community and we share these resources, we invite investigators to come in and to use these specimens for various research purposes, right? So we pool our resources together. Um, all of this is also based, dependent on lots of people, right? And the importance of people cannot be um, overstated. So first I wanna point out my Malagasy collaborators, Mary-Jean Vahalilelo and Steve Goodman, who's also based at the Field Museum. These two individuals, plus their, um, the dozens and dozens of people they've trained over the years, have uh, gone and surveyed all of the islands, um, I wanna say hundreds of sites across the island for the last 30 years. And this has really led to our, our understanding of, um, our modern understanding of birds in Madagascar, right? So without this, we wouldn't be able to do any of the DNA work we were, are doing now. We wouldn't be able to do any of the morphological comparisons, any of the high scale um, information that we've been able to get, it all comes from these, these efforts. Um, and then the training of students, right? So they've trained, um, I wanna say more than 200 students who fill, now fill various positions in government and uh, education across and conservation across Madagascar. So this is a really important effort in all these fronts. And then lastly, the impact it has on people here. So the pictures on the far end there are pictures from, of my team, people that have worked in my lab with me on various aspects of this research project. And we have uh, dozens of undergraduates, graduate students, as well as a postdoc. And you know, um, the, the aspect that we forget about is how exciting and inspiring it is to think about working in a different part of the world when you're, um, and doing it through um, all the information you can get from museums right here, right? And so all of this put together is how uh, we can build this story. So I'm gonna tell you the story of what we know about birds in Madagascar today and take you to the other side of the world. Um, here's, oops, doesn't work, okay. <laughs> Madagascar is that large island off the coast of um, Africa there and probably most famous for, um, right there. Uh, 
Um, <laughs> now it works. Um, probably most famous for its lemurs, right, that are found nowhere else in the world. Everyone uh, has heard of lemurs, knows about them, knows that they're strange looking primates. And um, just like lemurs, there are other strange and cool looking animals and plants that are only found in Madagascar. So it's this biodiversity hotspot and um, exciting for this idea of that there's so much endemism, things that are found nowhere else in the world. So why is that? Well, we think of islands as being these natural laboratories, right? They're isolated, um, they're hard to get to, so not a lot of species can get there. And so when they do get there, there's less competition, less predation, uh, perhaps more access to resources in that context. And so evolution can happen, we often observe, in um, faster ways and in more dramatic fashion. And so most famously, the Darwin's finches are a great example of how we can observe this, right? You can see bill shapes changing in response to environmental changes. Um, and this is an example of what we call an adaptive radiation. And this, it, uh, the, and we've seen, noticed these kinds of uh, phenomenon in other parts of the world, right? Another great example are the Hawaiian honey creepers, which again, you can see very clearly demonstrate how uh, shape and size and color might transform in, in response to environmental situations. So they have um, thin, narrow bills that they can use to feed on nectar, fat, thick bills that they can use to um, bite through seeds, et cetera. So Madagascar is home to several of these endemic adaptive radiations. And um, for example, with the lemurs, you have this one ancestral population of lemurs that got there several million years ago, and over time have diversified so much that there are over 100 species of lemurs today. Right? And so really dramatic in terms of what can happen in these situations. And the same is true for other groups of plants and animals. And what I'm going to focus on is what um, has happened with birds. Madagascar, or, uh, as an island that we know today, started out as a part of Gondwana, the supercontinent, and really began to form what, uh, to look like what it does today. 88 million years ago, when Gondwana was rifting apart. And it was last connected to India, uh, sorry, here, 88 million years ago. And then since that time, has roughly stayed right there next to Africa in almost the same spot, not much changed te tectonically. Um, and really um, interesting that everything else seemed to change ever so much, but Madagascar has stayed the same. So 88 million years ago, this is what the birds look like. <laughs> okay, so obviously not birds, but very close relatives of birds. Um, these are the archosaurs, right? And we have actually a quite a rich fossil history in Madagascar. There's lots of new explorations as well that are turning up um, cool and bizarre creatures, just like we see in modern times. And uh, this is just a small representation of them, but I want you to notice a few things. One is, there's quite a diversity, right? There's quite a diversity even on the small island back then. So Madagascar has always been able to support quite a rich biodiversity. The other thing to notice, and maybe you can uh, even in these slides, is they're kind of strange looking. <laughs> um, even, even back then, there were some things that were kind of uh, really bizarre. Here's this guy that has this like crazy underbite that um, uh, its teeth don't quite fit in its mouth. <laughs> and uh, these are actually very close bird-like dinosaurs. They're not, um, they're, clo they're close to the lineage of modern birds, the birds that we see today, but um, they're very much dinosaurs. So this one here was a recent discovery where they found that it has this crazy big sickle bill, just like a lot of modern birds do, um, but the rest of it is very dinosaur, right? And so you have these kind of, this evolution of very bizarre shapes and maybe there was something in the way that um, they got to Madagascar and were able to diversify into um, very specific forms. So um, non-native dinosaurs, of course, die out at the end of the Cretaceous. Modern birds and mammals really um, evolve right before that. Um, but 
well after Madagascar is already an island, right? So how did they get there? How did they get to Madagascar? Well, we think that most modern groups got there by um, either flying there or rafting there. Rafting means that there was probably a big storm or something that um, picked up a lot of vegetation, threw it onto the shore, and formed many islands. And we've actually observed creatures that were able to um, you know, sit on these islands and kind of um, wait it out until it gets to shore. So that's an easy way for them to get easy. <laughs> it's one way to, for them to get there, right? Um, and we should expect, given that it's right near Africa, that this would have happened quite often. Well, it turned, but it didn't, right? And so that's been one of the mysteries of Madagascar. Why aren't there more things from Africa here? Um, and one reason is because we've now been able to show that the oceanic currents actually blew the opposite direction. So they blew from Madagascar towards Africa rather than the other way around. And so there were very few times when the wind conditions and the ocean currents were just right for them to be able to come from Africa into Madagascar. And we see this very obviously in the mammals, right? Mammals don't fly except for bats. Um, and the ones that don't fly, there are only four lineages that have ever made it from Madagascar to, uh, from Africa to Madagascar, right? And just from those four groups, we see more than 250 mammal uh, species today. So pretty dramatic. Um, in terms of birds, birds have um, other means of not just, they can raft and they can fly and they can get blown off course by uh, storm systems in, in multiple ways. And so we actually have a lot more groups than four in birds. And I'll show you some of these groups now. So one of the oldest lineages of birds um, that we know in Madagascar is the elephant bird. Sounds made up, but it's a, a bird that we think um, was, we used to think was closely related to ostriches, right? It's a large flightless bird, the largest bird that we um, have evidence for, and laid the largest eggs. That's my um, little trivia. We actually do have a cast of this in the Bell Museum, if anyone's interested. Um, we'll probably have it on display as well. It's, um, I like to tell the story that this is the, physically the largest an egg can get, right? And it's much, so it's larger than any dinosaur egg, and um, the largest it can be to be um, a hard-shelled egg, yet porous enough for the embryo to grow. So um, pretty cool natural history there. And we used to think that elephant birds were closely related to ostriches, which are found in Africa, of course. Um, but with new evidence from DNA, we can actually, uh, elephant birds are now extinct, but we can actually get DNA from their eggshells and um, use this with DNA from lots of other um, living and extinct rat tide species. And now we think that elephant birds are closely related to kiwis, which are found in New Zealand. So this is kind of bizarre because kiwis are on the other side of the world, but perhaps tells the story of how rat tides were able to diversify after the breakup of Gondwana um, with, with both um, ways that um, were driven by continental splitting as well as over ocean dispersals. Um, Madagascar also has other bizarre groups like the cuckoo roller and the mizites, which are so strange, people had no idea where they went, what they belonged to, what they were closely related to, and it took lots of bird tree of life studies and whole genome level studies for us to, oops, um, very, um, conclusively show that cuckoo rollers are related to other carassiiformes, and mesites are actually related to sand grouse. But these, these are single representatives of orders, right? Nothing else that's close to them living today. Um, Kind of around that same time, we have groups uh, such as the Ascides, which are old world sub -Ossines. And uh, what's really cool here is you see this guy, this uh, is sometimes called the false sunbird. 
And you can see why. It looks very, very similar to a sunbird in terms of the uh, thin, pointy, curved bill for nectar feeding. And um, in terms of its iridescent colors, too. And um, if it didn't have this crazy wattle eye, I think a lot of people would confuse it with a sunbird. Ground rollers, which again are um, kind of a unique family that for a long time we debated its relationships, and they're related to rollers from um, Asia and Africa. And around 20 to 15 million years ago, we have um, the origin of some of these, some of the most diverse groups in Madagascar. So today, what we see as the three most diverse groups, the Vangas, the Tetrakas, and the Kuas, and I'll spend a little bit more time talking about these groups because they are the most diverse groups in Madagascar. And then very recently, we have the appearance of a whole bunch of different uh, lineages in Madagascar, and uh, these are represented for the most part by one or two species. So perhaps they don't have a lot of time, they haven't had a lot of time to diversify, uh, They've just recently got there. Um, but an interesting um, question still in terms of how and when they got there. I mean, how they got there. So how did birds disperse to Madagascar? So um, we talked about Africa being where we should expect most of them to be coming from because of proximity. Um, but birds can fly, and perhaps there were other um, ways people have proposed ideas of maybe stepping stones. There are little, little islands here, and maybe they use that as a way to come from Asia. Um, and when we look at the evolutionary history and trace back by geography, we find that of the groups that we have data for, um, only about a third of them are actually coming from Africa, right? Uh, and a third of them are coming from much further away from Asia. Their close relatives live in Asia. And then there, there's a third of them that we just really can't conclusively say. So maybe the, these are groups that are um, either so old, we can't conclusively say where they're um, coming from, or, we, um, or their close relatives are found across the world. And so it's hard to pinpoint exactly where they're coming from. Um, but interestingly enough, there's a substantial number of the avifauna that comes from Asia, and this seems to be consistent in terms of timing and in terms of um, the uh, that in, and in terms of the fact that there are no relatives in Africa that are similar. And then from Africa, we get this pattern where there are some really old lineages that got to Madagascar and some very young lineages that get, got to Madagascar. And so, perhaps this um, this this is in response to those ocean and um, wind currents that changed ever so much uh, a few times in the past. So the, one of the questions we were really intrigued by because, you know, I was interested in looking at these adaptive radiations in Madagascar is how this happens, right? How and what, what can we say, what can we a study to show if these are adaptive radiations? A lot of uh, times people will say, oh, there are a lot of species in this, in this group, and therefore it's an adaptive radiation. Well, adaptive radiations also signify that they are changing in response to environmental situations. And so we want to show, we wanted to study how this was happening in birds in Madagascar. Um, a great example of how people have studied this in Darwin's finches and in uh, honey, uh, Hawaiian honeycreepers is by looking at actual shape changes in their bills and comparing it to their close relatives. And what they found is that, so um, this is a, a um, plot of bill shape changes. And in Hawaiian honeycreepers, which is the blue filled in box here, you see that, and their close relatives are this lighter green box here, which you can't see as well, but um, you can see that the shape of bills in Hawaiian honeycreepers is very different from their close relatives, right? And the same is true for Darwin's finches very different. So there's a shift in what they look like. And this is a good indication that they're responding to something that's unique in their environment. So we set out to see if this was true in some of the radiations in Madagascar. And we started with the most dramatic one. So Vangas are, um, in my um, opinion, rivals with Darwin's finches and Hawaiian honeycreepers for, for really exhibiting this dramatic sense of adaptive radiation. Right? Um, here's a group of 
23 species, all originating from a single population that got to Madagascar about 20 million years ago and evolved very quickly into the forms we see today. So within a million or two years, we have all of these different lineages and then further diversification within. Um, and you can see just by these images here that they look quite different in terms of their bill shapes and sizes. They're quite different in size, um, body size as well, and in coloration. And they're doing different things with their bills. So um, part of the story with these, um, I don't have it in this figure. Part of the story with this um, group is that originally we didn't know how big it was because they're so different looking. And it took um, lots of DNA evidence and including anything that we thought was so different in Madagascar, we just didn't know where else we would go. Let's see if it belongs in the Vangas. And it turns out there's a whole bunch of species like that. So here's this guy, Newtonia. Oh, you see these little um, DNA models? Those are all species that were once placed into different families. So this was once placed into Sylvia warblers. This was once placed into pycnonoted bulbuls. This was a babbler before. Hippocida, we thought was a nuthatch. It's the, and um, you can see it here in, um, in its habitat doing exactly what we think of as nuthatch is doing today, uh, here. Um, and then here you have this crazy sickle-billed vanga. And we think this vanga fills the niche of what a woodpecker would fill. It actually uses its builds to root out into the bark and catch its prey. And there are no woodpeckers in Madagascar, and so here's an open niche that they can fill into. And so this dramatic radiation is, we think, a, a response to all these open niches and possibilities. Um, we looked at the bill shape and sizes to, 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 again, see if they exhibit a similar pattern to what Darwin's finches and Hawaiian honeycreepers have. And um, here you can see this is a plot of the size of the bill. And these different colors indicate where they're coming from. So the Madagascar ones are the, the Vangas that I just mentioned. And these are their close relatives in Asia and Africa. And you can see that the Asian and African ones cluster very um, to, to the small end of size. And the Malagasy ones are distributed across a much wider range, right? And similarly here, when we're looking at shape, you see that the Malagasy ones, the uh, green again, are in a different part of the space, the shape space. So again, showing that they've shifted and they've gotten, they've changed uh, dramatically from what their ancestral um, size and shape would have been. We've studied this in different ways. Um, here's a three-dimensional model using photogrammetry. And again, we can sh show quite dramatically the red um, squares here to show how different they are from their close relatives, right? And so um, this is um, also, I'm not showing this slide here, but in other studies, people have found that the amount of variation that, are, that is in the Malagasy Vangas is on the order of what we see across all, all passerines. So pretty dramatic that in just this one radiation, we see that much variation. Um, and the variation seems to also be a response to behavior. Um, we know that these different groups are using their bills in different ways. So this, these are gleaners. They use their bills to just pick off their food. These are salliers. They're going out and flying out and catching their prey. And these are probers. They're using their bills to pry through bark and other substrates to get their food. And it seems like their, um, the amount of evolution in, within these groups is substantially different from other groups. And so again, this sense, just like in Darwin's finches and Hawaiian honeycreepers, that um, some aspect of function is also driving the evolution of these species. And I just wanted to give you a preview because I'm so excited by this. My student is now looking at CT scans, and we can use this to not just look at the outside bill and shape size of the, um, these uh, birds, but we can use CT scans. And we've been doing this with museum specimens, right? Um, 
And we can look at the bony inside of the bills, as well as the carriage and outside, as well as the skull at uh, attachments close to the bill. And so we can kind of use this to look at how all of these parts are integrated together to form the, what a bill does, which is one of the most important features when we're looking at, um, when, in terms of what birds need to, for um, all the things that they do. Another group I wanted to talk about is the tetrakas, and this is really important for me because this is a group that we didn't even know about until the year 2000, right? So this is a hidden radiation. This was a, a number of birds that for a long time were placed into different families, into um, three different families, maybe more, um, given past taxonomy. And we just thought because they were kind of similar to babblers and kind of similar to warblers and bulbuls that they belonged in those large families um, that are, are more diverse in other parts of the old world. Well, it turns out that they're superficially similar to bulbuls, warblers, and, and babblers, and they're actually an endemic radiation. So again, an ancestral population that got to Madagascar about 15 million years ago and really um, diversified, maybe not as dramatically as Vanga's, but still so. And um, we're able to do things um, in ways that are similar to what's found in other parts of the world, but in their own unique way here in Madagascar. Um, what's also amazing in this story of uncovering this group is it turns out their closest relatives are um, Gonocobius, which is the single monotypic species, has its own family, and for a long time, again, confused people about what it, was, uh, what it belonged to. And it turns out they're closely related to the um, tetrakas of Madagascar. Um, and, their close, um, and their next closest group is the locustellids, which are the old world um, uh, warblers, <laughs> grass warblers. So um, again, with the tetrakas, even though they're not as dramatic a radiation, we see quite a shift in their bill size and shape. These are similar plots to what I showed you with the vangas, and the berniards are the, the reddish ones here. And you can see that they're different from where they're, uh, from their close relatives, indicating a shift in what they're, um, what they're doing there. So, um, So one thing that's really interesting about Madagascar, another thing that's really interesting about Madagascar is that it's both, it acts both like an island and a continent, right? There are aspects of island biogeography dynamics as well as continental um, dynamics. And so I talked about the island ones in terms of reduced numbers of species that arrive there. Um, and we can um, use the principles of island biogeography to make predictions about this, right? So there's lots of um, theories about the size of an island and how many species it can support. And here's a plot of the area of an island versus the number of species that exist there. And what's um, interesting is here's Madagascar, this dot here. Much lower than we should expect if this was our expectation of that principle. So it seems like there are not as many species as we should expect to find in Madagascar. And one question is why? Why is that? Why are they fewer species? Uh, especially given that there's so much diversity within the island, right? It's a large island, and it has quite a lot of habitat diversity. And in fact, you'll see that there are species that are found only in this, this habitat, which is a humid forest, or species that are only found in this habitat, et cetera, et cetera. And so, you know, there's habitat diversity and microendemism found in Madagascar. And so why is this number still so low? So one question I had was perhaps this was again an issue of hidden taxonomy. Perhaps we're not recognizing enough of the diversity that's there. And so for all of the species that we were able to get multiple samples from, especially from recent collections, we were able to go through and look at their DNA and look at their morphology and look at different aspects, different, di different traits. And here are just some examples of um, species that we thought previously were single species widespread across the island. And these different colors indicate actually 
distinct lineages, lineages that are distinct in their genetics as well as their morphology. And in the cases where we had other information, um, we use that as well to show that these are actually distinct lineages. And in just the two groups that I mentioned before, we were able to um, increase the number of recognized species by eight, right? So this tells you in a group that, you know, generally we know a lot about birds, but in this part of the world that is still not as explored as it should be and not uh, analyzed as it should be, um, there's still a lot we can find. Um, we're also, we also know that there's been a fair amount of extinction in recent times given the um, given human impacts. So elephant birds, as I mentioned before, are recently extinct and very um, conclusively we can show that they went extinct shortly after the arrival of humans to Madagascar. Um, here's another example of uh, a, a snail eating kua that was only found in this little island here and on this coast and again um, has uh, gone extinct in the last hundred years. So. Um, we, we're hoping that as we survey this island, we can also st uh, you know, learn what is unique, what is different, and uh, what are the different species to make these areas um, as important as they are for conservation. But at the same time, these areas are uh, rapidly, rapidly disappearing, right? Um, and some of the, the, for example, this entire area here, a forest, is a very recent deforestation event. So this is creating div divergences even within populations very recently. And so kind of taking um, information from different sources and information from different types of plants and animals and habitat and um, paleoecology and recent ecology can really help us to tell the story and to figure out ways that we can use this to impact conservation today. Um, oops. I'll just end with my last slide there. Um, before I go, I again want to say that this is an ongoing study. We have a lot that we're doing, and um, there are a lot of people that have contributed to this. So one thing I was kind of curious about is you, you talked about um, the Kiwis on New Zealand. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that flightlessness kind of evolves in these island habitats where there aren't a lot of predators. Um, so I guess there's two questions I have. One is, why is, is that the only example of a, a large flightless bird in Madagascar? And two, why did elephant birds get so big? Like, I, as far as I know, there aren't any huge predators for them to really avoid. Um, yeah, that's so great questions. Um, so the, the size could be a number of different things. One is they might have just a propensity for a larger size because they're related to other, other species that are big, right? The ostriches, rheas, and emus um, also get quite big. And um, it's not clear if they got big in isolation, just like they lost flight in isolation. So the, the um, previous story was that these were large flightless birds living on Gondwana, and when Gondwana split apart is when they uh, fractured and divided into um, with the continents. They wrapped it off with the continents. But um, new evidence shows that they're, they actually evolved after the splitting up of Gondwana, and that changes how we interpret the flightlessness, and we think that they went independently flightless on all these different land masses. So they could have just had that propensity to go flightless, and then you know, kind of the, the final step was when they uh, were on the island. And then the same for the, the large size. So there's also evidence of, um, of reptiles where, and, and other birds where the, we call it uh, island gigantism, right? So they, they kind of get bigger because there are less predators and they lose flight. And so some of the, the kind of byproducts of losing flight is that you get heavier and you, um, you don't need to invest as many resources in staying light um, if you don't have a lot of need for it, right? Um, there are other examples of flightless birds right now. Um, I, my mind is, um, I can't quite think of all of them, but like, for example, the Mizites are practically flightless. <laughs> you know, there are a couple of things that are just, you really have to work hard for, the, for them to, to, to move. And so there are a couple of things that are on the order of not 
um, if, if not fully flightless, uh, getting there. So. Awesome. Thanks for your questions, everybody. Thanks, Yushma.